Welcome everybody to the seventh Event Tech Talks of the year this, uh, this year. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about digital marketing tools, tips and tactics. I will say we've already pretty much had a 45 minute conversation about it, so we will try and answer your questions and get as much information over to you as possible. Um, there's a few things that you can use to engage with us as the audience. You can obviously use the traditional, put your hands up, we have a catch box here so we can throw it to you. You can ask these guys your questions. We also partnered with Me Too. Um, you can visit web.me2.io, log in there, submit your questions, other people's questions, you can upvote, and we'll use those to direct some questions to the panelists tonight as well. Um, we are being live streamed as well, so we'll have some questions hopefully submitted from people watching online. And there is also an event app that you can download and see kind of who else is in the room and some more information about tonight's event. Um, we've got a very good panel with us tonight. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves individually because they'll do a better job than me and then we'll start and jump straight into some questions so we'll start with you ricardo and then we'll work his way down good evening everybody my name is ricardo molina and i run a marketing agency specializing with events and inbound marketing my name is tamar beck i'm the ceo of an event tech company called glean in and we have referral marketing software and previous to that i used to be an event organizer Good evening. Uh, my name is Karsten. I'm, uh, I'm a digital marketing consultant and I also run a company called Event Tech Partner who helps um, event tech companies with their growth. Hi everyone, um, I'm Emily Johnson. I work for a company called DLP. We're a creative communications uh, agency, it's all in-house. Um, and I do the PR and social media and work in that team in the marketing department. If it's easy for you two guys, you can use that one, Emily. You can use that one, Karsten. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Obviously, digital marketing for anybody, whether you're an organisation, event organiser, you're organising your own event and you want to market out, is quite breadth, uh, there's quite a big, broad depth to it. What I'd like to do with the panel, though, to first off, is, is kind of frame it with some of the biggest challenges I think event organisers face. Me, personally, I think there's too many ways to market an event. When you've got email, social, the amount of social mail, uh, email account, uh, social distribution options there are out there when you've got Instagram, some dark social that we talked about earlier, Emily. Yeah. But I'm going to throw it to the panel. What, what do you think is your number one, Ricardo, what's your number one biggest kind of footfall for, for event marketers to kind of market their events? What's the biggest challenge you see? I think, I think the biggest problem is time, really. They're, they just don't have time. They're probably all operating at 150% output. So it doesn't really matter what you tell them. It doesn't matter what you share with them. They just, their brains are like, literally toasted so which is a shame because everyone's really keen to to un, to learn and to new to, to learn what what's new what's going on but um by the time they get to and they get to learn understand how a tool is used and all that stuff they just they just give up they go back to email do you think that's as well because most of the marketers are obviously marketing more than one event at a time they might be marketing they might be an organization that markets multiple industries or they've got just a series of events like we have that are coming up through the years, so they're constantly marketing those events. I think it's, I think it's really difficult to generalise because if you're talking about a big expo, uh, I know Tamer can have experience. They're probably working on one big show through the whole year, and they might have bigger teams, bigger budgets. If you're looking about conferences, then obviously you're talking about probably more marketing, more 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 events at one given time. I just, I just think that like. It's just inexperience, and when you when you go across the board, all the event leaders really they just like to hire people that are just off university, and sometimes it's just the blind leading the blind. So, um, and they just kind of try. They're, they're doing their best, really, and then I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's it's more like it's training. It's, it's it's all this aspect. So I think that's an issue. I don't know if you guys kind of. Yeah, have a different view. Yeah, because a lot of uh, tenants they focus more on like tactics and trying to follow like best practices. But instead of um, having like just tactics, they should more focus on uh, like strategy and planning and what their main goals are. Um, instead of like just following and copying uh, best practices from the internet, because today you can find any digital marketing advice on the internet on Google and. Um, yeah, people just um, don't, they focus on too many things, as we say, and also on too many tools, there are too many tools available. So um, keep the focus and, uh, and focus on maybe one channel instead of 10. 
Well, Tim, are you obviously you work with a lot of exhibition organisers, quite substantial, large organisations that have got lots of teams, lots of event marketers in some sense, but you hear quite often there's some challenges for, yeah. for them themselves. So they rely so heavily on email marketing. So I, th I think in, in our part of the market, which is trade show organising, email marketing is the, is the main channel for driving registrations. It's becoming, it is really difficult to deliver email. And so, um, although these organisers, whether you're big or small, they depend on owning that data and the quality of the data they've got so they can deliver email to it. But because that's not working, every cycle of show your marketing, the results are less. So um, they're also fearful of trying new channels because um, they may be inexperienced in it. They spend so much time doing email, <laughs> writing email, trying to deliver email that they don't have much time left for anything else. And there sometimes is less experience of wider uh, marketing practices. Um, and there's a lot of fear around trying something. What if it doesn't work? You get, especially these people that are working on one show a year, you, you mess up, you don't get another opportunity. Yeah. So and there's that, a lot of responsibility yeah. on their shoulders for delivering registrations. And, and I think just on that matter, even if they try something new, they, they don't know how to <laughs> go to their it. boss <laughs> and say, boss, listen, this is, this is, these are the results that we've received, right? Don't know how to measure it? The, sometimes. Sometimes they don't know how to measure it. Sometimes it's just like they're measuring the wrong things. Okay. So, like, the, the typical leader wants to say, okay, how many registrations did we receive for engaging on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever tool you're doing, right? You know, and then you're like, excuse me, mate, it's not about registrations. It's about, okay, are you getting visits to your site? How is your site converting? Yeah, you're investing a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds on Google Ads, which is all revolutionary. But then you're 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 dropping people. You're on your front page of your event. Come on, you know you, you really need to kind of start focusing on those on those I, areas. I think you know? though, we've talked about this a lot. <clears throat> I and having been an organizer, it has to come back to registrations because that is the business. So they, they have to be able to track track what they're doing back to a registration and if if it's difficult for them to track and difficult for them to prove that that action or that money spent delivered the objective then they're going to find it really hard to justify keeping that money in the budget or, yeah, yeah. or doing that again. So on that, so I agree with you, hard to track especially when you're doing lots across different platforms. Is there any kind of basic metric or formula that I'm not suggesting there is but is there any way that we can just kind of take one project and do some things to measure it. Ha, is, does, has anybody got anything to offer there? Do you mean uh, measuring it? Measuring the response. Like, yeah, yeah, measuring the response. That you know, the effort. You can, everybody can calculate the effort and time that they put into something. But yeah. how do we calculate? I don't want to say ROI because it. But you know I, that. What's the return? There's, there's three. There's three determining facts in my in my world and and and, and with whatever work we do with a client. They look, forgot about engagement. Forgot about everything. It's just three key metrics. How many visits you're generating to your website? Because ultimately you need to bring people to your house. So you're inviting people. Ultimately, what you're doing, you're inviting people to your house. Come, enter. People get on the door, and then. How many people come through the door? You need to ask them, do you want to sit? You want to go to, you want to, you know, you want to have a drink, you want to have a coffee, whatever that is. So visits, leads, which is however number of people download your brochure, however people download whatever piece of content, or however people kind of subscribe to your newsletter. And then ultimately your conversions. So to me, those are the three, three key metrics. Forget about anything else. And then I think, and, 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 and uh, to talk about that on time, is like, Social media, it's not, no one is going to go on social media to register for an event. Someone's going to actually come to, the, to check the website. And then it's down to you to actually convince them to, to engage with them to some level, actually. Okay, do you want to register? Yes or no. But if I don't want to register, what else are you offering me, right? Okay, do you want orange juice? No, I don't want orange juice. But I want some water. Oh, I just, oh I'm okay. Okay, do you want to have some bread? Do you want to have, you want to have a quick read? Whatever, you want to read the newspaper. Yeah. That's kind of sort of stuff. I don't, I don't know if that, the analogy is kind of the right, but ultimately, if you have a handle of those metrics, then you're good. I think every marketeer, probably I, I wouldn't be fearful to say about probably two thirds of the of the marketeers that I that I that I speak to, they don't know, they don't know how many people that convert from a visit 
to a lead or let's just not even call it a lead. They don't even know how many people are filling in forms on the website. And that to me is worrying. Um, and I guess that, 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 that doesn't matter because if you have a handle of your conversion rates, then you can just start measuring the results because you can say, you know, if I generate a certain amount of visits from social media, I know that X amount are going to convert and therefore, you know. I think this is interesting. So th does that come back to the fact that they don't know how to measure it or they haven't got the tools to measure it? Because I think it's got to be one of... Yeah. You think it's both, yeah. anyway? Yeah, yeah I, th I think as well, when it comes to social... Well, my remit is social media. But when it comes to social media, you really have to think about every single part of the process. Like, you have to plan it. You have to plan the campaign from start to finish. So the pre-event, during the event, and post-event, how are you engaging with those people and how are you continue, continuing that conversation afterwards is really, really important. Um, and there are ways you can go about doing that and you can get, you know, adverts on Facebook, adverts on Twitter, adverts on Instagram, adverts on your website, Google, Google Ads and things like that. Um, but you, you ultimately do have to track it and you do have to plan it in. You can't just throw something on there and think, oh, yeah, that'll work, that'll be fine. You have to physically plan it and know, start to finish, how it's going to work. You mentioned there that you could continue the conversation. How yeah. do you go about continuing that conversation? You mentioned Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Is that using retargeting or is that using other processes to kind of continue that conversation? I think re retargeting and also talking about the successes of the event and, you know, making people think, oh, hang on a minute, I wasn't at that event. Why wasn't I at that event? I should be at that event. I want to be there. Um, and 70% of um, things that are shared through social media are live experiences. So people want to share those experiences. People are already sharing those live experiences. So encouraging them to share when they're at an event and why they're there and how much of a great time they've had and things like that is really important because then all their friends and friends of friends might see it and go, oh, that's, that looks good. I want to be there. Yeah. Um, I suppose one of the tactics we're using tonight is that we're live streaming this. We record the content and then we repurpose that after the event. Now, I hear from a lot of event marketers that they're scared of uh, recording and redistributing and live streaming because they're scared of a reduced forced attendance. Wow, um, people would prefer to kind of sit on the train and watch it at home or watch it later, which in some cases is, is very much true. But we see it as a massive marketing tool for us and all the content at Event Tech Live gets recorded and redistributed afterwards whether you attended or not. And it's there, it's part of, you know, the content's happened. There's no point in pretending it didn't. The most valuable thing is to remarket it to those people that either missed out, like you said, yeah. or didn't quite catch all the conversation, or have just stumbled across the, the event and the content and kind of want to get a feel for what's being said and done. That's how we personally kind of continue that conversation with people. Although I will say I think retargeting is a very, very powerful tool in terms of being able to provide people content around your event when they're not necessarily at that moment engaged with, yeah. with your content. We've got, some, we've got some questions here. I think there's a, a very interesting one, which I wasn't expecting to come up tonight. It's the, it's the top one. Um, with so much new technology and things like AI becoming more prevalent, what does the marketing team of the future look like? Do, does anybody see the, Emily, do you see yourself getting replaced by a robot? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's already happening, though, isn't it? Like you can go on a website now, and a chat bot will come up. And, and talk to you, and that, there's nobody there behind that. That is artificial intelligence. And it's same with um, on Facebook, um, when I'm managing campaigns and things like that, Facebook will message me through Messenger and say, hi Emily, just to let you know, um, this, your recent advert has had such and such engagements, blah, 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 and, it, and I can actually have a conversation with Facebook AI. It's really bizarre. So, uh, no, I definitely think it's gonna be something that happens in the future and something that we all should be aware of. But at the end of the day, we, we can't, there ha still has to be somebody behind it. There still has to be a creative behind it, um, a reason behind it, um, you know, and, and measuring it afterwards. You know, we, th there still has to be a person at the end of the day. Yeah, I think there definitely has to be that human connection. I think where AI and technology such as that will help make the process easier and more accurate, I think we'll be able to talk to a lot of different people on a very personal level using technology like that because it can do a lot more of the background work that it takes us as humans a lot of time to kind of sift through and see yeah. the results of things and see who's engaged with what and then decide what to do with that. don't think it will replace anybody. I hope yeah. not anyway. There'll be a lot of our industry out of a job. 
I think, so. I think the, the skill set will change from a marketer today um, from the one tomorrow. Basically, I think marketers need to understand data. They need to understand a little bit of coding as well because yeah. today with, um, with so many tools available, you need to be able to understand APIs, integrations, you need to understand data, you need to understand a bit of coding. So I think the skill set is changing a little bit and people are, or marketers are more, um, yeah, it, people demand marketers to be more educated in those areas. I mean, I, I think when, when everyone asks about the marketing, the marketing team of the future, I sometimes laugh because everyone always ta talks about all this kind of, I guess, utopia world. And, and, and my complaint, my complaint with all the colleagues is like, we're still marketing events like it's 1999. <laughs> so for God's sakes, why are you talking about virtual and all that? Not a bad thing if you've got a retro event. Was that? Not a bad thing if you've got a retro event. <laughs> but no, no, exactly, yeah. So, and, I, and I think that, to me, it's actually very scary. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very scary for the events industry. Again, it's one, one side of the industry, if you're the Coca-Colas, the, the big brands that can spend a hell of a lot of money on, on all these interesting things, they're the ones that engage the big agencies to do, to, you know. But in our real world, right, the exhibitions, conferences, and, and, and probably B2B marketeers that are using events as lead generation, they just don't have enough, enough budget to spend on all these things. So I think, and actually what Carsten's saying, the skill set is it's not the future, it's the skill set that we needed probably 10 years ago. Marketeers need to, need to be able, and, and I think kind of what Emily was saying, Instagram and all these things, and, and actually referring to the, the cool, funky tools. <laughs> Marketeers don't even know how to use bloody YouTube uh, video editor. You see what I'm saying? And they're really, really looking to hire someone else. That's that's crazy. You know, now you can just take your phone. You can take a photo at a conference and build a video on your phone. But the marketeers do. And, and again, I I advocate for marketeers, and it's not their fault. It depends. I, they are different. I think yeah, it, they're it, different in different uh, Absolutely, and I'm generalising. Yeah, I, 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 I do think but, the tra trade show industry, the way it markets, is very behind. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very yeah. behind the marketing curve. But stuff like AI and all of, everything that you're talking about, it will come, but they're still catching up with you know, marketing practice today, let alone yeah. what marketing practice are going to be. I think they're still, they're still chucking quite old-fashioned marketing out and they're, they're, they're um, sending marketing pieces about their brand <coughs> to people that don't have any affiliation exactly. or relationship with it. And people, you know, human beings are just... Human beings just react differently to yeah. stuff like that these and, days. And you know what? It's, it's actually not to spoil the thing, but now and it links with the connecting the dots with... How many channels should you use? Eventbrite did a, a research, and, and marketeers overall, they say, they use between three and four channels. And the reality is that they need to be using more because the audience is somewhere else where we don't have a clue. That's the holy grail, right? Mm. But I think on that, the most powerful tool that we have as event marketers is the one that we've all got in, on us today. It's the mobile phone. Mm. And to take that step further, it's a video. So I did Absolutely. it this morning. On the, I got to the train station, I had three minutes before my train come, I took my phone out, recorded a video about this event tonight, I posted it to Instagram, LinkedIn, and my Twitter feed before I'd stepped on the train, and that got engagements across the board. It got comments, it got likes, and it got shares. So within two minutes, I'd used three networks and distributed a piece of content that was personal because it came from me, to my connections on there, the people that were already following me, and it resulted in some kind of engagement. I don't know whether anybody turned up because of that. <laughs> but <laughs> in terms, <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I think um, you could you could say that. So for um, an event organizer, that one of the key channels of people that have already got a relationship with yeah. their brand, that is just that's massively off the list, and they continue to market to people who've got you know, n no desire for that. And actually what you were doing with your content, you said, and I put it out there with people that I've got a relationship with and then they share. Yeah. And it's that, that power it's that, of it's that recommendation. Yeah. It's about what you were saying with your, um, you know, if, if people have got direct relationships with somebody and they actually start to recommend your event, it's about thinking of your yeah. visitors and your exhibitors and your sponsors and all your friends and partners as, as marketing channels, 
you know, if you just did that, it would make a massive difference because those, those you know, those exhibitors, those sponsors will be using their own social media channels yeah. and things like that, but they will be talking to people they've got direct relationships with. Yeah, just to, we had a conversation earlier, we've got Event Tech Live coming up on the 9th of November. We looked at our pool of advocates and we look at the speakers, the exhibitors. They all want the event to be a success. They've all got a network. They're all invested in the event. They're attending, they're coming along. Mm. They're spending their own time on there. So we're helping them with the tools that we've got and the resources that we've got to help them leverage their network, not just to blast things out there, just to kind of invite some personal connections. Tamar's got a tool that we've used for three years very, very successfully, um, which is about advocacy. It's connecting up to your network and inviting people and making them aware that you're at the event and stuff. And that for us works better than, believe it or not, a massive database of 20, 30,000 people and sending an email to them and saying, yeah. come along to the event. And what I, was, what I was going to say is actually the completely opposite side of like what is the future, and I'm sorry to go about it, but is I've seen some people, some event leaders, actually, because Google is kind of, they know who's spamming and who's not. They're trying now to send emails from their own internal servers, and, and they're running away from email ESPs, trying to send batch emails from the email servers just to try to bypass the, you know, the... Mm. Uh, which I think is crazy. So we're actually going backwards. They're, they're, this is short-lived. It won't yeah. get any <laughs> No, no, that's what I'm saying. People don't, don't want that marketing you know. anymore. If it worked, people, it would be working. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that GDPR is coming <laughs> next year because it's like, it's going to kind of cut, uh, email, cut a lot of stuff. But uh, let's see what happens. But um, Do you think it's not working because it's not too personalized? Do you think people are just... Um, Basically, sending out blasts, or I hate this word, basically. I think people are lazy and they don't want to personalise because it takes a hell of a lot of time at the moment, in my own opinion. Yeah. It's easier to send a button to everybody mm -hmm. and hope for the best. And it takes a lot. But and it used to, it used to, you could nail that down to an absolute percent of what you would get out of those databases. Who knows who was on it? You could send out 100,000 emails and you knew to the You'll get through point, it. yeah, to the percentage point what registration you generate out of it, but it's not like that I mean, anymore. And this is the case, you know, we've, we've, we've done some metrics. We have a client that is actually hating their ESP and they want to move away into this kind of thing. And they did a, they did a test. So average click-through rate using their ESP, our email service provider, it's getting, it's reaching probably about 8 to 10% um, click-through rate. Sending it through a batch email system through their own service. They can only send a maximum of, I think, a 1,000 per day or per user, whatever. So it's, they, they have to kind of, it's getting between 12 and 15% click-through rate, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, from the metrics point of view, it works. But from the Virgin. pissing people off, and excuse my French, it's not. And it's how, how sustainable is that over the long term? So my conclusion is, you now need to kind of stop relying on email because if you're using dot .mail or whatever tool you're using, Gmail, you know, Microsoft, and all, they know that that's coming from where it's coming from, and it's going to go into somewhere that it says newsletter, right? So, and then you're going to have a thousands of those. But then you need to start engaging somewhere else via text, via WhatsApp, via, you know, all these other things that are, that, you know, LinkedIn, LinkedIn personal messaging, and all that stuff. That you have, you kind of have like micro groups of people that you engage with or that they, you know, uh, at, at different levels. And, and I think that's complicated when you have a marketeer <laughs> that one needs to market seven events yeah. over I, the next year. I, you, you mentioned before we started talking about Event Tech Live, we're exhibitors there. And if we just talk about email, so, so not, you know, talking about other tools that you could use like ours, if you just nail, even if you just nailed it down to email and you've got your exhibitors marketing via their own email with customers, so people they've got direct relationships with that the organiser doesn't. We all know, like from my history, I know that that, that that exhibitor marketing produced far better conversion than anything that we could do because it was between an exhibitor and their customer base and there was a direct known relationship there, whereas if we'd got the list and we tried to market our brands to it, the, the conversion would be much lower. So whichever channel your exhibitors or your speakers or visitors choose to use, you should encourage them to use everything at their, at their disposal. I think, I think for me as well, email is one of these things that once it's sent and it's landed in that inbox, that person will either engage in it or delete it. It's yeah. what generally one or the other. 
Whereas they'll very rarely forward things on to colleagues or friends or anything like that, especially if it's a very he a marketing heavy email. Um, and very rarely do people flag things to come back and look at later. Whereas with social, you've got the opportunity for that content to keep appearing in their feed because it's being shared or engaged with by people in their networks that may be also interested in that content. Or, as I do, they go on Instagram 30 times a day and they keep scrolling yeah. past it. So it we, keeps reminding them. We also them. think, like, um, you know, letting people... I, I think in probably 10 years' time, you won't even be registering with an email address anyway. You'll be registering yeah. with a mobile number. Yeah. Um, because my kids have got... Uh, the only reason they've got an email address is for social media accounts. They, they don't look at email. Yeah. And so if, you, if you're an event organiser thinking about how you're going to reach those people in the future, it won't be viral. You could chuck as much email as, as you like. Rent at Live 2018 when never they're only registered by text. So, <laughs> yeah. so for us, we're thinking about um, allowing people to advocate on, uh, using WhatsApp. Yeah. You know, because if, if it's all going to be around mobile, you need to make it really, really, really easy for people to be able to, uh, you know, send that on to, to contacts. And it's increasingly WhatsApp is going to be... Yeah. Let's, let's, talk, really let's talk about important. that further because you mentioned this earlier. Yeah, did, yeah. We've had a question from Jamie about dark social, which this falls into the category <laughs> okay, of. Okay, I can talk about that. That's not <laughs> And we've got, you've got <laughs> 10 more minutes. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, it's gone so fast. Um, so dark social essentially is any conversation that's happening online that you cannot track. So say, you're, for example, you're sharing an event or you're having a conversation with your friend about an event on WhatsApp. How can you see that? It's dark. It's dark social. Uh, messenger, Facebook Messenger, how many times do you go on Facebook and maybe don't share it on somebody's wall or maybe you think, oh, I don't want to leave that comment because I don't want other people to see that I've seen this cat video. Uh -huh. So then you'll send it to somebody <laughs> on uh, Messenger. So, or you might do it by iMessage or whatever else it might be. That is dark social. So the thing that obviously is happening now is how do we track that and where are people talking about things that we can't track it on? Um, and it was really interesting. I saw a case study um, last year, and Greg's ran a WhatsApp group um, for a Santa uh, pasty, pastry, a pastry, P pasty, pasty. Um, and essentially, it was like the the bag of the pasty was like a, a Santa's face. And uh, so they had this WhatsApp group that people could send in those photos. And during that time, it was Christmas time. Um, they got a one percent increase in their sales, um, and that's because of that WhatsApp group and that is because of dark social and they they tracked that you know people were talking about them but they may not necessarily be talking about them on their profiles they might not necessarily be tweeting they might necessarily be you know on their Facebooks and things like that so yeah that's dark social I could talk about it all day. Uh, <laughs> well, well, in terms of measuring that dark yeah. social element because I guess we our tool uses that to a certain element but the only parts of it that we can count or track is how many of they we know when the messages get sent and across what so we'll know the fa Facebook yeah. message is sent and we only know when people come back through track you know including tracking links and hoping that people are sharing tracking links it, it, and we're probably under reporting masses amounts of it because we don't yeah. know what's going on in the conversation you can't see it and probably rightly so why should we yeah it's, it's, it's all <laughs> encrypted anyway so yeah, it's, exactly. it is really hard yeah, yeah. and people are just going to be more private about those those conversations and I think you know that's a good thing. Yeah. So do you think as organ event organisers and event marketers that we should be trying to create conversations or just allow our attendees or potential people that are interested in our event communicate with them that way to start off with? Because from the only negative that I could see is that if you open let's say a WhatsApp group and let every attendee come in there that it just takes one negative comment for somebody and it's going to go just, you might as well delete it because it's just going to spiral because it's just human nature. Yeah. So, so that's the only kind of downside I see of, of, of using dark social to market your event is that it can open up the, a, a can of worms. I've heard people, I've heard uh, people, actually big organisers, using WhatsApp groups really successfully for speakers and things like that. I'm not quite sure you know exactly what's going on in the chats but it, it wasn't that the same conversation we probably had years ago about like twitter and yeah, god exactly. if we have a twitter account people start slagging the show of what's going to happen to us but you know <laughs> it happens and then it just it gets drowned out by other stuff yeah i, I think we'll I think feel braver about it as 
I think, I think getting Q, Twitter Q and A's or ask me anything or anything like that with speakers. Or anybody, any content that you've got going off at the event that people can engage with before event, I think, I think's brilliant. I think, I think is when when we refer to building conversations, um, I think we, I probably I refer with socialists building conversation with Tamer, building conversation with Cast and Emily and, and and with you, Adam. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I if I am running an event. On event marketing, I'll probably kind of ping uh, a WhatsApp message to four of you guys and say, "Hey, do you mind passing on just like that?" You know, and, and then I think that works very well, and I think you're having success because you, people follow you, people know you, Adam, as as the guy that kind of has this kind of uh, community, right? Where where I see the problem is, and and then actually we're seeing this. So, traditional organisations that have big, you know, basically they want to achieve scale, they have a problem because Marketeers are not influencers, they're just churning stuff out. I think the shift needs to happen is that they need to, again, millennials, they need to start building those conversations yeah. with influencers, right? So if they have, if someone is going to start marketing, and I think probably what I would suggest to any marketeer is that, look, you start building a, a list of your influencers. You, you, you probably, there are tools out there, SEO models, and you know, um, that you can kind of know who's, who, who is an influencer. Start building that conversation. Casting, for instance, connected with me on LinkedIn a little while before, and then we kind of, you know, that's the sort of stuff that marketeers are not, at the moment not able to do. They are scared of the phone. They're scared of, of, of writing some kind of normal email and engaging. And that's kind of, I think, uh, it's missing. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is definitely about conversation, yeah. 100%. Um, yeah. And it, you can't, when you have followers, don't think about them as followers. Don't think about your attendees as, as an audience. Think about them as a community. How are you creating those conversations and how are you speaking to them? Because it's really important. And I think, you know, so I manage social accounts at the moment and I go on every day and reply to anyone that's tweeted us, anyone that's retweeted us, anyone new that's followed us and just have a chat with them and be like, oh, thank you for following us or thank you for this tweet. It was great. Thank you for the photos. Thank you for the video, whatever it is. Because then that keeps them coming back. Oh, that was really nice. Like, oh, I'll keep up to date with them or whatever. It's they're not followers; they're people, and it is getting that across that we're all humans, and and as marketers, we need to remember that it's not just a mass audience. People want to be talked to I as a person. Same thing as you can see happening on Instagram with brands. Yeah, and absolutely. the and the fact that the new, um, <laughs> even though it's paid for, that they've gone out and got these relationships with ambassadors, so people that have massive followings, and they're using that mm. for, for marketing, and that is that hugely successful. Yeah. It, it, you can translate that in any yeah. event marketing. It might not be on Instagram, and it might not be as a paid ambassador, but uh, you have ambassadors. Absolutely, but I think there's two, there's two kind of uh, fundamental things. So I, I think if, if you are a small organizer, or you have like your own community, your small events, Everything on social is, is, is great, but if you need to get 5,000 people to pre-register to an event, you are going to have to pay. Don't tell me anything that's pure BS. You're going to have to pay Facebook because you're going to need to jump the queue. You need, you need the volume, right? You need to get that exposure. You're going to have to go, yes, on Instagram, and then you're going to have to pay so that and you know for for a nice creative to get that attention you're not gonna have to pay for the remarketing on, on all the sources and, and stuff like that as well as hammering your, your, your email database. But and I think the way a, an event is marketed to, to attract five thousand pre rates, ten thousand pre rates or five thousand ultimately come, that's a very different story when you're trying to get it five hundred to two hundred. I've I've seen some really good examples of, of Facebook groups actually being able to help conversation between very much like-minded people. I, I think there's a few people in here that are members of the event productions group, the delegate wranglers, um, the event technology help group. Mm -hmm. And as an event marketer, I'm starting to think about dissecting my events into areas of interest for a niche, so marketing being one of them for event organizers, being the one that starts and helps facilitate that conversation and inviting people that are from that background to also share conversation. That gives you an opportunity to be seen as somebody that's helping facilitate that part of the sector move forward. And then if you want to send the odd promotional email on there, a promotional post on there saying, by the way, your event marketers come along to our event because we've got one for you, then that's where you're going to get the most engagement that I've seen. But you're facilitating the conversation in a way that they're managing themselves, they're asking questions, they're communicating with each other. You're just sat there in the background helping that go along. And yes, if you've got a larger event database or you've got a larger event promoter that, get more people engaged. 
There's some massive groups on Facebook. There's, I think there's something like 10,000 people and pe people that park like idiots in Preston. That's how powerful Facebook <laughs> is in getting people together to talk about a subject. Whereas that, that platform is very much about conversation, whereas Twitter and things like that is very much engage and respond and it, it takes away. I think you've had some great success actually in the similar yeah. sense on LinkedIn, having you on a B2B level. Yeah, I also run a, a Slack group for community. So basically, <coughs> I run a community on Slack for marketers and founders, and I'm uh, constantly growing this uh, this community. And um, <coughs> what we find is that um, there are certain channels in this community, and we have uh, good engagement there as well. But um, what I found out over the last few months, also LinkedIn has completely changed its game. So uh, today, I see people still posting uh, a link to their blog post, no engagement, zero likes, zero shares. Um, and then people start to sharing more of their personal stories and their personal business experiences and becoming more human, as you say, yeah. and yeah. becoming more personal. And all of a sudden, you see like a, a massive increase in likes, in views, in engagement, and not even like in return on investment. Because um, I had approximately 200,000 views last week on all my LinkedIn posts and had about three inquiries um, just for LinkedIn. So basically, it's a really, really good tool today. But what do you share? I share personal stories, I share um, helpful tips, everything should be, I have my, my own like guidelines for what I should share, so it should all be helpful, um, actionable, it should all be like extremely valuable and um, honest, authentic. Not, not a photo of that, like when you started a job and everything, now that you have a big supercar and then everyone starts liking it because no, it's, no. Getting, it's, no, it's getting a bit no, crazy actually <laughs> LinkedIn as well with that. No, That's Instagram. <laughs> no, but exactly. LinkedIn, you start seeing all these kind of it's silly things where everyone's like, come on. I think so, too many people are taking the Gary Vaynerchuk approach yeah, though, yeah. to that kind of thing. But, oh, Gary, oh, I love Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, <laughs> I, th I, think, I think Carson's hit on the nail on the head there. As long as your content has some principles to it and you follow those principles and continue, then people will resonate with you. And I think it's very much becoming, uh, we've not mentioned the word tonight, but very much influencer heavy, our industry, the, the events industry. And that's always been that way because you've always used speakers to influence who turns up. But now we're seeing the power in actually the attendees are the influencers as well. They're the recommendation people. They're the people that don't get paid to attend. They pay to attend in some cases. And they've got the largest networks of people within your niche that you're trying to target. So selecting a few people out of your audience that you can help empower to talk about your event, reward them. You know, get them to talk about your event or, or talk to them as Carsten's doing on LinkedIn. It's probably the most powerful thing you can do at the moment, I think. I've just spotted a really interesting question on Go there. For Sorry. It. Um, somebody's put, I found that millennials working in event marketing don't actually always struggle with the things we're talking about today, but um, they are managed or led by people not so marketing tech savvy, so their hands are tied, agree or disagree. Um, I actually kind of agree with that. It is, it is hard because for people that are, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years older than me, they don't really understand it. They don't see the impact. They don't see the value in it. So I can 100% relate to that question. Um, but it's all about showing them the competition. You know, what are the competition doing? How are their social media channels looking? Um, how is their event marketing doing? Because if it's better than yours, damn it, we need to get on it as well then, don't we? Because when I first started at DRP, there was no DRP Facebook. But then I realized our competitors had it, and I was like, come on, we need to have a Facebook account. This needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I made that happen, and it is, it is just showing them you know, what everyone else is doing. And I'm sure we quickly they'll go, oh, yeah, we need to do that. <laughs> so guys, we have had 40 minutes on this already. And, and we, we haven't talked about tools. <laughs> 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 Quick fire question then. Ricardo, if you could only choose one tool tomorrow, what would it be? It's unfair. It's unfair because you know you know what I'll pick. It's I'll, a world I'll, of choice, I'll, man. I'll, 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 I'll email my my top okay. hundred contacts. Let me ask you a second question, and we'll ask the same questions. If you only had a thousand pounds to spend on marketing an event tomorrow, where would you Facebook. invest it? Okay. Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Tamar. Um, I mean, I would I would try and contact my influence, you know, people that I knew knew about that market and I would just pick up the phone and talk to them. If I had a grant, that was that would be all I would do. <laughs> and just encourage and, and ask them to share it. Okay. Yeah. Cast them. Thousand pounds? Yeah. You can keep <laughs> it if you want. No you budget. Have to market. No, I'm <laughs> keeping it. <laughs> no, it's difficult. It, it really depends on the event, but uh, if I had to spend thousand pounds I guess I guess Facebook's good. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't really. I, it really depends on the event. Like I wouldn't. I wouldn't know what to spend on my own, on my own event and just check out what the event is all about and wh where the audience hangs out and where they are and then spend the money on you know where I can find them. <laughs> Emily, where would yeah. you spend it? Uh, well, you know where I'd spend it. Social media, obviously. <laughs> but um, no, I agree with Carson in the sense that you do have to know your audience and where they're going and what they're looking at and what channels they're looking at. Definitely. But can I do my quick fire stats? Of course you can, go for it, yeah, very <laughs> yeah. interesting stats actually. Um, so uh, Facebook, definitely, if, if you had to choose one social media channel, choose Facebook because they have two million, uh, two billion, sorry, two billion users on Facebook. And then secondary to that, Instagram have 800 million, uh, WhatsApp have 700 million, LinkedIn have 500 million, uh, Twitter 328 million, Snapchat 166 million. So actually Facebook is the better option. Two billion people are using it so of course they're going to see your adverts of course they're going inter to interact and engage with them um, but yeah if you wanted to go down from that Instagram's your next option um, and it's becoming more and more prevalent especially in I know in my age group definitely um, but yeah Facebook everybody uses Facebook all ages use Facebook so me personally I'd invest it in a retargeting platform to a DFP so because that person's coming to my website or my content, they're engaged, and then the retargeting system can decide where to display that message to them based on whatever platform they're from. Having some, somebody that's used retargeting on Event Tech Live for the last three years, I can say it does provide a good return. But find a good agency that you can work with that understands it as well, because it can be done very badly. Who do you use, Adam? Um, we've used two companies over the last <laughs> two years. Um, we've used um, a US company called Feather. They do tend to be a company that deals with quite substantial large events and large organisers. But there is actually a London agency that we're working with this year called Tag Digital oh, that yeah, do yeah, just yeah, as yeah. good a job. Yeah. Um, cool. And you can do it yourself. I mean, you know, these are event specific, so they understand the event market a little bit more. But there are tools out there that you can sign up to and start testing from very little investment and just kind of test the water, see what return, what registrations you get or what engagement you get. I think people. where you've got a team who've not got the bandwidth or are unskilled, that using and, you know, I've heard both of them are really good. We've got customers who use both of them and it's money well invested to get someone to do that properly for you. And, and Tamar's system is very good as well. Yes, obviously. I mean, I, I, I have to say Tamar's is, is, is quite good because it's just about Thanks for uh, amplification. <laughs> no, but it's, but it's about it's about amplification where we were talking about technology is about yeah. Is and, and again, one thing like like Adam, if if event tech says come to this event, whatever it is, is different than if Adam says it. I'm, I can guarantee that if Adam says something, then you get better click to raise and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but it's true. What's, what's it's, really it's human, and yeah. then that's like yeah. what Carsten was person saying. It's, it's, person, it's having the yeah. person Personal. behind the, the brand. But what's also powerful about Tamar's platform is that it allows us to provide a widget on the home page of Event Tech Live that shows other people that have registered with links to their LinkedIn profile or social media accounts. So it's a, you can see who's turning up. Are they the type of people I want to network with? Are they my peers? Are they the companies I want to supply to? So it does it for you. It's, it's, it takes away the pressure. Well, it doesn't take away the pressure. There's no pressure. But it takes away me going, this is who turns up to our event, to you can see who turns up. So it's impartial then. Well, I guess there was a question about the, the technology, the, the, the tool and technology. And I wanted to share my, like, my, I've heard good things about Feather. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. because basically you just, it just, yeah, that's kind of, I think remarketing is, is, is the saviour for the uh, uh, cash strapped um, uh, event marketeers. Um, and I think Vidyard, it's a tool that you can just basically record video from your desktop and then you can use it for sales. You basically can record quick videos that you, you, you might amplify that um, through your Gmail, which is very, is very, is very, yeah. is very cool. Bit yet, they they also do. Uh, they have another department where they do personalization on video, which is kind of it just blew me away. Um, and I think kind of the big brands use it, where you can basically have a video and they kind of have your name printed on the video, and it's just, it's just like wow. Um, but I think more more down to earth, Wistia. I think it's is very. Good. I mean, it's all about video. Wistia yeah. is a is a platform that just simply allows you to put. Uh, contact forms on video so yeah. you don't really necessarily have to get them embedded on everything and I think the other the other tool that I've uh, I've always liked is um, it's called start a fire and that is a tool that just simply allows you to add calls to action 
when you're sharing someone else's content. So I think what it normally does is if you, if you have something on BBC or, or whatever it is, you just basically share it and then what it does, it just adds a call to action, whether you subscribe to your blog or following, and then you can still view the content. So it just kind of creates like a Is that one of thing. those scenarios where, I think we've got a blocker on that. Is that one of those scenarios where you almost, you reshare that content, if somebody clicks on your link, it has a little message from you as a brand or agency? Yeah, or yeah, at yeah, the bottom. Yeah. Because basically what, what happens is, I, 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 you know, we're talking about Feather, we're talking about video, you're talking about engagement on, on all this social media, it's all about content, right? But what, interestingly enough, what event organizers, what they lack is people that create content to share valuable content even though they're drowning in it. So a lot of organizations decide just to send newsletters with someone else's, uh, but then they just basically, from a marketing point of view, you're just driving traffic away from your site, you're just, just allowing traffic elsewhere. With start a fire, then what you're, what you're literally doing is you're still having the captive audience yeah. engage with it, which I think is very useful. And, and, and I think is, for me, it's game changing because you, you killed two birds with one stone. We've got a quiz, but before that, I will mention one tool that we use quite successfully. It's a tool called Wishpond. Wishpond is a great free tool to start off with that allows you to create pop-ups, pop-overs, and landing pages. If you've got a WordPress blog or you, you've got a website, you can run it, you can brand it up in your own domains. It's got lots and lots of options. What we've noticed is that information specific to our event that an attendee might want, an exhibitor might want, a sponsor might want, um, even some of our guides and things like that, we, we use that tool and you don't need a designer, you don't need anybody technical, it's literally drop and build, put your text in and you can literally have a landing page launched in under five minutes. So that's where you can get very specific about how you're targeting people and who you're targeting to. And then it's like MailChimp, you pay for the amount of leads that you generate. So if you're not generating any leads, you don't pay for it. If you're generating thousands, then you pay for it. It's as simple as that. It's a very easy tool to use on the back end of websites, create specific content for people, give them something for free, you know, give them some information, some stats, a report, a white book, a video, and people will give you the contact details. Right, quiz time. Let's see how much you guys actually know about marketing. Are you guys included? <laughs> so you can access the quiz using the um, meeting ID on the Meetu app, or as before, go to web.meetu.io and that long, very, very long number. Um, we'll have the question, the countdown, countdown, and then we'll show the answer for that question at the end. Um, guys, do you want to go to the first question, please? So the maximum number of characters in the first tweet is... To be fair, 141 is quite, uh, <laughs> quite bad, isn't it? Question number two, please. Which of these are the top three social networking oh. sites by active users? So I oh, think my answer is actually... Not active, yeah. Actually, <laughs> The answers, please. <laughs> Emily, why don't you why don't you remind us of what your what your mm. stats said? So you had yeah, you yeah. had Facebook, Instagram. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Facebook. so Facebook two billion, uh, Instagram eight hundred million, and then we went down to WhatsApp seven hundred million, LinkedIn five hundred million. Twitter, 328 million, Snapchat, 166 million. So maybe there's not a wrong answer, but we had, on our users. research, we had Facebook first, YouTube second, and then WhatsApp YouTube, as third. I should third. put YouTube on there, actually. Well, WeChat was quite popular. In Asia. I, I think in, in Asia. Asia it is. It's I, not I think over it here. It's the network in Asia. Yeah. 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 It's bigger than WhatsApp yeah, and stuff massive. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's massive. Because it was it was UK <laughs> and Europe. <laughs> 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 Hands up who organises the event in Asia. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> 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 you do. <laughs> yeah. oh, we, we chat, chat then. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We chat. 
Um, question number three, please. Which is the world's biggest, sorry, its second biggest search engine next to Google? And the results? So 66% of you are correct. YouTube is the second biggest search engine next to Google, which is also owned by Google, so it kind of makes Video it the first. <laughs> All those people wanting to see cat videos. <laughs> um, <laughs> question number four. What are the maximum number of hashtags you can include on an Ooh. Instagram post? Maximum. <laughs> Then. I think it should be three. <laughs> so the correct answer is 30. 30. The key to it is have 30 saved in notes on your iPhone and then just copy them across every time you do a post. <laughs> even on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, question number five. I'm not even sure I have to pronounce this properly, but what is an intersocial? Is it intersocial? Interstitial. Try and say that for a few minutes. It's a pop up. Yeah. We use them. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, use, everyone uses it now. Does it work? Like, <laughs> they do work. <laughs> um, okay. What, the next question, please. What does C R O stand for? It is actually, it's 91% of you have actually got it right. Conversion rate optimization. Wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised. Because <laughs> I didn't know that before I looked it up. Um, question number seven. Which social network is owned by Microsoft? Anybody gets this wrong? <laughs> Let's go to the answers. It is actually LinkedIn. They bought it, was it last, two years ago, last year? Last year. Last year, for some ridiculous amount. It's not even the right answer. Got the wrong answer. <laughs> it says Instagram. It says Instagram, but it's not. Oh, it's not. Somebody else got that wrong with LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> LinkedIn. 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 Yeah, LinkedIn. Yep. Snapchat, which is the next question. Snapchat offers ephemeral content. That was the wrong question. We've got a different question. All oh, right. <laughs> Somebody's moved them around then. OK. How long should your page meta description be before it gets truncated? <laughs> <laughs> The, answers. the answer is actually 155 to 160 characters. It's quite a lot, but it's still only like one sentence, really. Similar to Twitter, I guess. Yeah. Think. Question number 10. CTR. Easy peasy one, this. Yeah. What does CTR stand for? Yeah, 
Fifth Sign. Everybody well done. <laughs> that could be only one person that's answered that, though. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, a very technological marketing term. What does SAS stand for? <laughs> So in my opinion, 7.14% of people in this room got that right. <laughs> software should be with a service, but it is actually software as a service. So 92% of you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I will try and relay some of the questions that we didn't get answered to the panel and try and remarket that to you via an email over the next couple of weeks. Uh, please share the content on social media and the video if you think any of your colleagues are, would be interested. And a round of applause for my colleagues and panelists.